This video is gonna look at one of the most celebrated, loved, important, and controversial bands of all time, The Beatles. What better way to look at a band than through the music? By looking at what I think are the top 10 drum beats from the Beatles that everyone should know. Entire books like this one have been written about this band. Oh, this one's over 600 pages in length. They are highly researched. The beats, the turmoil, the lawsuits, we're gonna cover it all. And while we can talk and discuss about the drum parts, how they were constructed and the band and how it played into the music and how it sounded, no one can play them like Ringo. It would also be insane to try to uh. retune each drum to try to match what they did in the studio for all of these songs. So in that respect, you'll have to deal with me attempting to the best of my ability to stand in the musical shoes of a legend in the drumming community. Let's look at the Beatles through a lens that you may have never looked at them through, and that is the drummer. Right out of the gate, we're gonna start with one of the most controversial drum beats in the Beatles catalog. That's the groove to Tomorrow Never Knows. Now this song heralded really a new era for the Beatles. You see, they had their live period and then they had their studio period and this album was kind of the dividing line for that. Now what's controversial about this is what Ringo actually played because there were so many overdubs of percussion as well as loops. That's right, they were experimenting with loops and the big deal about this was, this was magnetic tape they were recording to so they had to actually record the loop chop it and then tape it together. Paul became obsessed with this idea and then asked everybody to go home and come back with some loops. He made over 20 himself staying up all night. This is also the first example of a close mic bass drum, which is why it sounds so big. So you will hear some other percussive sounds in there. One particularly that people think he played on the upbeat of one is two 16th notes that people think is a hi-hat. It actually sounds more like a muted type of a tambourine. They were notorious for making a tambourine not sound like a tambourine. This also features a Another signature of Ringo, which is avoiding certain backbeats by using tom patterns. Can't emphasize enough, when playing this groove, you have to play this ride cymbal really, really soft so that the drums come out above that. It's a great exercise in control. In this next one, I'm gonna give you a twofer. It's gonna be the drum groove for Please Please Me as well as Twist and Shout. A little band drama for you, everybody loves that, right? Pete Best had been replaced in August of 1962 by Ringo. This song was released as their second single. It was recorded as a single, but also included on the album later in November of that same year. So Ringo joined the band and bam, already he was knocking out hits. For the album version, get this, the band he recorded a full album, 11 songs in just over 12 hours. This is a good time to talk about one of Ringo's signatures. It's the way he plays the hi-hat. He played the hi-hat with a swishing motion. And if you play the same groove and then change the way you play the hi-hat, it slightly changes the feel of that drum beat. This is a very slight and nuanced thing, but with music, it's the nuances that make the magic. We're humans. All of our personal idiosyncrasies and little quirks actually combined to make great music. This next drum beat is actually said to have come from the brain of Paul McCartney, and that's the groove for Ticket to Ride. This groove features some offbeat snare and tom hits, and that came somewhat of a, a staple for Ringo. At about the 220 point, Ringo does a really subtle shift to the drum beat that I'll demonstrate, and it actually does a lot to push the groove forward. The drums were recorded in two takes, and actually John Lennon uh, considered this one of the earliest heavy metal albums because of particularly how the drums sounded on the album. And now for the controversy. The reason this is controversial is this is one of those times where notating a drum beat on sheet music really doesn't do it justice. You see, you have to realize something. When we put this to a grid, you've gotta realize that 
The intro is at one tempo. When Ringo does a drum fill and the band comes in, we are very obviously at a different tempo. And within the drum beats, you will have two beats at one tempo and then two beats at another tempo. And he does this pretty consistently with the first two beats and the second two beats. You see, that's what happens when humans with beating hearts decide to create music. All those little imperfections make it feel a certain way. Now, let me demonstrate the inconsistencies. Here's the basic groove. The treatment of the back half of that measure is what's in discussion here. So whenever he has the offbeat snare flam and then the offbeat high tom flam, the treatment particularly of that high tom flam is what we're talking about. So I had to decide a way that we notated it for this video, but just know you need to listen to the music and try to mimic exactly what Ringo's doing. This next song came out in 1964, it's I Feel Fine. Many people like to put the Beatles in a bubble, but they were actually just a part of a larger musical movement that was happening at that time. The drum part is based off of the Ray Charles song, What Did I Say, as well as Watch Your Step by Bobby Parker. You can hear similarities in both of those songs. The Motown song Money, That's What I Want by Barrett Strong also has a similar treatment of the drum beat. With the Latin sounding ride cymbal bell, which was happening because they were pulling jazz drummers in to play rock albums, it gave it a very different feel. Check out the 19. 57 recording of Great Balls of Fire by Jerry Lee Lewis. Again, you'll find that ride cymbal bell pattern kind of in that song. Ringo played this type of beat really well. So in the first measure, you have a quarter note followed by six eighth notes. One and two and three and four and. In the second measure, you have one E and a two and three and four. He's playing the first backbeat on the high tom actually as two and, and then he plays a rim click for the four. And as well, you can't hear everything properly, but you will hear him throw in the uh of one on the second measure on the tom, high tom as well. This next song is considered by many to be the key song in their entire repertoire, and that's Strawberry Fields Forever. I almost didn't include this one because it includes so many drum fills, but that actually makes up part of the drum beat. For this groove, the shaker does a lot of the heavy lifting to keep it tied together. Now for this, I could break out the individual drum fills and we could get all nerdy on that, but I like to give you the tools that you can use to recreate and make it your own. So what you should know is whenever you play sextuplets, one, two, three, four, five, six, you can eliminate the second one, one, two, three, four, and then the fifth one, and you have a galloping feel. Play around with that and you'll start to hear some drum fills that sound Ringo-ish. Be sure to download the sheet music for this video. It's in the video description as well as a pinned comment. It's gonna have way more than I'm talking about here. A lot of examples of variations of the groove, drum fills, all of that stuff. So be sure to download that because there's a lot more information there. The next one is one of my favorite songs from their catalog. It's Golden Slumbers. This is a really good example of what was going on at the time. And that was some very big orchestral cinematic drumming that was happening within music, rock music in general at that time. You can also hear this on the pet sound album by the Beach Boys, a lot of that type of drumming. Where it never really actually settles into a drum beat, it actually is a sparse 
almost a style that you would play as an orchestra. The basis of the groove is one and two and three, and then the last fill he varies, but if you played this fill, one and two and three and four E and, you would pretty much nail the feel there, and then you can play around with different variations of that. I talked earlier about the Beatles being influenced by tons of different music from all parts of the world, and this song and album is no different. The song is All My Lovin'. On this album, you can hear the influence of Black American music, Smokey Robinson, and girl groups, which that may not be a thing for you now, but back then it definitely was. This drum beat contains Ringo's signature sloshy hi-hat, and then this is a great example for what was going on at the time. We were coming out of the swing, jazz, blues era, and we were morphing into rock, and so you had some rock players, you had some blues players and jazz players, and they're trying to make this straight music, but some of the bands swinging and some of them playing it straight, and it's just like, a, it's a very distinct feel and time period for music. This song is a great example of that. This groove feels like it's going in between a shuffle and a straight beat, so going in between a It's kind of walking that line. The main groove, which I'm gonna show you, actually feels slightly more swung than it does straight. But when he goes to a, what I would consider a more Motown type of a snare drum four on the floor, you can hear his hi-hat pattern straighten out. So the whole song is this tightrope walk between, are we swinging this or are we playing it straight? Or, oh, you know what, let's just do it kind of different all through the whole song. And that doesn't really matter because it feels awesome. This next one was almost, uh, I gotta include it on here, even though it's been taught so many times and so many of you are like, oh, I know what song it is. One of their most famous songs, one of the most famous songs that's covered by them, one of Ringo's most famous drum beats, it's none other than Come Together. And what a lot of people don't know about this song is there was a lawsuit that came against them for copyright infringement. This album features a lot of Tom work and this groove is no exception. Now, I won't linger on this too long, but what I do wanna say is oftentimes it's taught with only two toms, and sure, we can play it that way, but it's actually played with three toms very distinctly. Once you slow it down and then you speed it back up and start going in between those, you can hear that. I'll demonstrate it slow and fast, but what you should know about my setup is actually my first floor tom is my lowest sounding and my second is my higher sounding. I've kind of reversed them. So you'll see me playing it a little bit differently than maybe you'll play it because most people have a high tom, mid tom, low tom. I have a high tom, low tom, mid tom. This next one is actually the last full song cover that the Beatles ever did, and Ringo sings on it. The song is Act Naturally. The part itself is not that hard, but well, the reason I included it is because it's kind of a Ringo-ism, a, a staple for him. Very quick and precise hi-hat work that doesn't falter the entire two minutes or so of the track. He never misses a beat, and he is locked in tight with it. You can also find this same type of quick hi-hat pattern in the title track of this album, Help. And this last groove, I just had to include, and some of you are gonna be like, Steven, is that even a drum groove? Well, that's one of the reasons I had to include it, because on some of their recordings, you go, the drums played what? 
and it worked. Why? That was part of the beauty of the Beatles. They were constantly experimenting. They weren't afraid to overdub parts. They weren't afraid to take parts from other sessions and put them together with songs if it was something that they felt artistically and musically sounded good. He's playing straight triplets. I'll play them left, right, right. And it's really hard to tell these early recordings which tom he's playing this on. So I'll play it on my high tom and my low tom. And this drum beat doesn't even really work that well as a drum beat except for the overdubbed tam tambourine that doesn't sound. Remember I told you they were famous for making a tambourine not really sound like a tambourine? It's tambourine-ish and it comes in on beat three and that really helps to tie this pattern together. 